few miles inland, Laguna Seca Raceway entices with legendary corners like the Corkscrew and has become a dream destination for sports car racing fans. And since 2017, the Ferrari Challenge Series, a championship where dreams can come true, has forged a connection to the storied venue, unleashing the speed and beauty of all things Ferrari during its annual visits. And so it is for 2020, as Ferrari Challenge North America returns for the fifth round of the championship series. Hi everybody and welcome to WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. I'm Greg Creamer, delighted to be joined in the booth for the call of this race by Paolo Roberti, fresh from a run at Le Mans in, of course, a Ferrari. Thank you very much uh, for calling me and I'm looking forward to watching the race with you. Yes, it's gonna be great fun indeed. And of course, right now the field is out on their formation laps and getting ready to start this race. This is the Copa Shell Am race. First of the double headers on this great weekend of racing at this absolutely wonderful venue. And it's one of so many awesome venues that are part of Ferrari Challenge North America. We've already been to Daytona, Road Atlanta, Indianapolis, most recently Circuit of the Americas. We're now at Laguna Seca, WeatherTech Raceway. We then go to Sebring International Raceway, home of sports car racing in the United States. And then the finale, Mondiale, goes to Misano, originally scheduled for Abu Dhabi, but now in Misano, an absolutely marvelous venue as well. And that is fantastic. Now, if you're not familiar with where WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca is, it's the Monterey Peninsula, essentially, on the west coast of the United States, the Pacific, just minutes away. Absolutely stunning location and an incredible racetrack befitting this remarkable location. And uh, just a joy to be here, as always. And uh, the track itself, well, it's a pretty remarkable place, just about two and a uh, uh, quarter miles or thereabouts, 11 turns, and incredibly challenging. And the thing it's known most for, two things, the corkscrew and not much grip when it comes from the driver's perspective and the crew's doing setup on the car. But it does produce some absolutely remarkable racing. And, of course, the weather today, absolutely stunning. I mean, this is the picture postcard perfect type of weather we're having here. Mid-60s right now, those are the temps in... Uh, Centigrade, Fahrenheit, mid-60s, low wind, mild breezes, absolutely fantastic. So the stage is set. Let's get down and meet our pit reporter for the weekend. Hello, Katie Osborne. Hey, Greg. And it is an absolute beauty outside here today. And, of course, being at Laguna Seca, one of the most iconic tracks, but also extremely challenging for many of these drivers. Greg, you mentioned the corkscrew. Justin Weatherall said that turn is one he's focusing on. Kirk Fairwald said turn two is one of his focuses. And... Todd Coleman said he's really focusing on all of them. But as you also mentioned, Greg, dreams really do come true here in the Ferrari Challenge and racing here at Laguna Seca. For one driver in particular, Jesus Mendoza is in his fifth event of the season and his fifth event in his career. But his Ferrari starts long ago. Everybody has their reason for getting involved in Ferrari Challenge, but specifically the love for Ferraris. Let's take it off track right now and get to know Jesus Mendoza. He's in his first season here with Ferrari Challenge, but this actually, the love of Ferraris goes way back. What's the story? Well, when I was 12 years old, my friend, as a doctor, uh, he got a Ferrari. And I used to go and clean his cars and wash his cars. And I dreamed for Ferrari. I didn't have any, any money, anything. But I came and started my own business 36 years ago. And unfortunately, I dropped my business and I've been able to buy Ferraris. And my goal was to race and challenge it. So I've been uh, practicing in 2017. And last year, I got my license to drive and challenge it. So impressive. He started his challenge uh, this his challenge debut this season, uh, starting at IMS. You've run four races here, just learning the ropes of competition. What's been the biggest takeaway for you as it relates to being a competitor? It, it's, it's been fantastic. Uh, um, I always told my coach, I just want to learn the basis, safety. For myself, safety is my priority, my family. So uh, I got a very good coach, very good team. We don't take chances. Uh, but there's a lot of people that are very, very competitive, very competitive. Yeah. Now, I heard your wife was here as well. How special is it to have an event where your family can really support you at it? It's really amazing that I have support from my family and everything. I want to fly planes, but they don't want me to fly planes. But <laughs> they do want a, a middle race, and uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy it very well, much. 
Let's take it here to Laguna Seca. The first time you laid eyes on this track was only a few months ago. Now you're racing a race car, a Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo in it. What did you learn in practice that you're going to take it to the race? Uh, it's a very, very tricky track. You know, we used to race in Cota and, and uh, about four weeks ago in Texas. It's an incredible, busy track. But this is a very difficult track. It's a very, very technical track. So. Uh, uh, we're doing pretty good. We're doing pretty good. <laughs> you know, you can't see it, but underneath that mask, I imagine there's a smile. Jesus Mendoza qualified 17th today, and I imagine we'll have a whole lot of fun out there. That's Thank you. Fun. Thanks very much. All the best. And Jesus' story is one of so many in this paddock, how to go from being a fan to a Ferrari driver. Does it get more special than that? He talked about how challenging this track is. Well, we're very fortunate to have one of the top competitors in the Trofeo Pirelli AM category. Give us a lap from an onboard view with Dave Musial. Hi, this is Dave Musial, car number 30 in a Trofeo Pirelli AM class here at the WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca. Hi, this is Dave Musial here at WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca. We're gonna be coming down the front straightaway, heading underneath the bridge towards the center of it. We're gonna let the cars track out a little bit to the right hitting about 145 miles per hour. We're gonna brake heavy, turn in, catch that apex, be patient, get back on the power hard here, heading into turn three. We're gonna to wanna to make sure that we take all of the track, use it, get back on the power, upshift to fourth gear. About the two marker, we're gonna brake, turn in again, get back on the power. You gotta be careful here, it's tight. Now we're heading underneath the red bridge here. We're going to brake, downshift, catch the apex, stand on the power, don't go off track, use it all, close. Heading for turn six, underneath the bridge, downshift, turn in, off the power, back on the power, use all the track. Now we're heading back up to the famous corkscrew. You gotta line the car up correctly, look to the right, brake, wait, patience, slight left, hard right, back on the power, Hold the car, let it track out, power, 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 lift, shift, catch the apex, let the car track out all the way to the right. Now you gotta get ready for this, quick hands, slow turn in, let the car track out. About the three board here, we're gonna hit the brakes as hard as we can, we're gonna hold on, we're gonna wait, be patient, turn in. Third gear, all the power, all the track, and that's a lap here at Laguna Seca. Now that's two and a quarter miles in a big hurley. And, and, and Paulo, we listened to Jesus. We've heard other drivers talk about this is a very tricky place. What makes it so tricky? Yeah, it's a really uh, old style track. Uh, the track is very technical. The grip of the asphalt is not so high. So you have to fight with the, with the car. We have to fight with the tires uh, grip. Uh, so it's a very challenging track. Yeah, absolutely it is. And that's one of the reasons we love coming here. And it looks like we are just about ready to get this race for Copa Shell Am underway. It's time for those most special words in racing. Katie? Ladies and gentlemen, start your Ferrari engines. All right, the command has been given, and the cars will be springing to life. Obviously, we'll get the crews to file away from the cars and get ready for this race. We've got 30 minutes of competition here, Paolo. And you, you talk about the, the uh, grip on the track and the sand that's part of the track. Um, a lot of tires really struggle with degradation here. The new Pirelli P0s that they're running, I know they're better over a longer stint, but you still have to take care of them, yes? Yeah, for sure. The, the new tires uh, of the 2020 tires are for sure better than the, the previous one, the last year. So you have to also keep uh, a good pace from the beginning, but don't go too fast, otherwise you destroy the tires uh, after a few laps. So it's really important to, to drive well, smooth uh, with the gas, uh, to don't destroy the tires in the first few laps. And you've got 670 horsepower at command. Now you've got traction control, which I understand with the new Evo has even been a little more refined, but it's still with the low grip. It's very easy for these cars to slide sideways and the like. So precision is really important here. Yeah, as we saw in the, in the video, in the onboard video, you, you need to be passing on the power, especially in the exit to the corner to don't to oversteering uh, because uh, after a few laps, uh, the tire's degradation will be high. 
and the new Evo package, I, I, I wanted to get your input on this. I know that they've addressed, there's a lot more downforce, particularly on the nose the of the front. car. It's now much yeah. better in yeah, terms of front. balance, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 yeah, the front is much, much better compared to the, the previous car. Uh, now the downforce uh, is much more, so you use less steering wheel angle than uh, last year, and uh, you enjoy much more the driving of the car. Yeah, I could imagine, uh, you know, with a little bit more stick and 670 horsepower, it has to be absolutely magical. And uh, we are looking at the field. The grid is now clear. We're just waiting for the signal to send them out on their way behind the beautiful F.A. Tributo, the official pace vehicle, Ferrari Challenge North America. And the field is setting out on its way. A couple of cars, a little recalcitrant at the back there, but now they are moving. It looks like the entire field is out. And heading into the legendary Andretti hairpin, one of so many iconic corners here. Let's take a look at our starting lineup. On the front row on the pole, his first is Dave Musial Jr. for four, Ferrari Lake Forest, alongside points leader Justin Weatherill, Ferrari of Central Florida. Row two, Surreal Choksi of Ferrari of Denver, and his teammate Todd Coleman. Then we go to row three, Michael Watt, Ferrari of Atlanta, and Christopher Aiken, Ferrari of Houston. Then in the fourth row, Kirk Beiervault, Ferrari of Beverly Hills, and Charles Whittle, Ferrari of Central Florida. Next row, Lisa Clark, Ferrari of Beverly Hills, and John Visca, Boardwalk, Ferrari. Then Luis Peruskia, Ferrari of Tampa Bay, and Jan Bernier, Ferrari of Seattle. Up next, it's Anthony DiCarlo, Wide World Ferrari, and Neil Langberg, Ferrari of South Bay. Roy 8 is Roy Carroll in the Ferrari Cars Italia. Entry in George Zachary, Ferrari Silicon Valley. Row 9, Jesus Mendoza, Ferrari of San Francisco, and Robert Hertzberg, Colley, Ferrari of Detroit, and Rounding out the field, Eileen Bildman for Ferrari of Long Island and John Lennon in the Ferrari of San Francisco entry. John actually qualified quite well, but after qualifying, he found that uh, they found the rear of his car was just a little bit too low, and so rules are rules, and he had to go to the back of the field. And Eileen Bildman, who didn't get a chance to get out in qualifying, should be starting at the back of the field as well. Great to have her in the program. There is a ladies' cup for the uh, lady competitors, and she and Lisa Clark are running in that. There's a gentleman cup for the more experienced drivers in the field, and there is also uh, a very important and prestigious dealer's cup, and that's why we always make mention of those Ferrari dealers. As we're coming down for the green, just give us a little bit. I know you've driven that uh, that F.A. Tributo, the, the uh, pace car here. Uh, it, it just seems like a remarkable car. Yeah, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, it's a good step forward compared to the 488. Uh, we are using uh, in the course of Pilota School. It's very fast uh, and uh, also is smooth compared to the Pista. So the performance uh, are similar to the 488 Pista, but uh, you can use it even every day. Yeah, it's just a, an incredible car and uh, looking for that car. Watch for it here as it makes its move into pit lane, and the field will be coming around turn 11. Remember, when you get the green flag, you cannot pass until you cross the start line. Now, the finish line here is the first line that they'll come up on, and you watch for it here. It's under the bridge. That's where they will be getting the green flag and setting this 30-minute race underway. What a beautiful field. The Ferrari 488 Challenge Evos. Green flag flies. We are racing. And Musial Jr. leaps to the lead. Weatherill tucks right in behind him. Choxie right in tow. Everybody being very careful, at least at this point. Double apex Andretti hairpin here. You need to sort of settle in here. You don't want to get into turns three, four, and five. And there's a couple of the cars that I was talking about that are leaving from pit lane. Although, oh, and a touch! Immediately a little bit of a touch, and I think that's a real Choksi that has gone around. Yes, it is. That's really unfortunate. He was looking forward to another great race. He has been on form as of late, and he's going to now be at the back of this field. And that has given a little bit of a break up front to Musial Weatherill in the third place car. We'll try and make sure we know who that is at this stage. I'm guessing it's going to be the 169 of Todd Coleman as they work now through turn six. And here we go. First time at serious speed up into the corkscrew. Having a look here, a little wiggle under braking, pushing hard early. And now dropping off a 10-story uh, building, essentially, as you drop down through this corner. That has to be an amazing corner to drive uh, at speed in a Ferrari. Yeah, for sure. When I went here the first time, uh, it was my dream to, 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 to drive uh, in this uh, track, especially for the crosscrew corner. It's, it's known around the world, as yeah. people think about it, for sure. All right, and Musial, what a story. His first pole position, 
and now leading in that moment with Choksi and uh, getting turned like that, the two of them just touching, uh, has opened up this big, big gap at this stage. And uh, that's going to be, it's going to be Aiken, I think, is going to be the next part in line after that breakaway group up there. Aiken, then Whittle. Yep, and that white, primarily white car. Then behind him, that uh, purple and orange Clemson Tiger livery entry of Michael Watt, who had a big win at the most recent round at Circuit of the Americas. He's found himself definitely on form, but uh, we've got a little bit of a gap that's developing here between our top three and then uh, the next group of three, and then they've got a little bit of a margin behind Watt right now, back to the 113 of Beiervault. And Lisa Clark, who uh, qualified in the ninth spot, she is up into seventh. What happened here? Just a con that was turn three. Yeah, yeah, it was a race contact, I think. Uh, they were side by side. So it's difficult to get through yeah. that corner side by side, and I'm not sure that Surreal realized that the uh, car was right up underneath him like that. So we go back now. This is the 166 of Whittle up and through the corkscrew. Michael Watt starting to put some serious pressure on. This is through Wayne Rainey curve after the legendary 500cc world champion. And you can get a great run out of Rainey, and, uh, but you've got to be all the way alongside down into turn 10. Watt, not a, he didn't telegraph that at all. Whittle never knew it was coming. A beautiful pass by Michael Watt. Very, very nice move. Uh, he break later, but uh, very clear. So he did a very good job. And that's part of the game is not to telegraph anything. Uh, but when you do a move like that, there are two ways really to make a pass. You either let the driver know you're coming so he can see you, knows you're there, or you can surprise him. But if you surprise him, you've got to get alongside him fast. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's one of the most difficult track in the world to overtake here. Yeah, so he did a very nice move. I find that interesting, of course, because turn 11 is a tight, yeah. yes, the tight, tight corner, one. and, yeah, uh, the tight you, one the and you'd track. think, oh, that'd be an easy one, but uh, you've got to get those runs through rainy, through turn 9 and 10 to make it work, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's good. You did very well. So you see now the, the first uh, three cars are forward, so they're doing a very good pace. Yeah, right now, Weatherill sitting in second has just turned a race lap of 130.335. And that's not too far off where a lot of people qualified. And he's doing a nice job right now as he's uh, lost a little bit of ground to Musial up in front. Then Coleman staying right with Weatherill at this stage. And as I said, Weatherill comes in. He is the points leader. And uh, just a great story if you haven't watched any of the previous events here as we take a look at Musial as he comes through and completes another lap really strong and on form here today and Musial has taken great advantage of I, I think one of the great programs in Ferrari Challenge is the club challenge concept where you drive the same cars you're not racing door to door but you can still get amazing coaching yeah, yeah you can learn a lot because you, you do you drive in the same track of the the calendar championship, so you learn the track, uh, you have the coach on board with you, so it's a very fast way to, to, to learn uh, to drive the car. Well, he did a lot of the club challenge last year, our leader did, and then showed up this year and was right on the pace, so I think that's great testament. And of course, and uh, his dad is doing well here. Yes, yeah, absolutely he is. His dad has been very, very strong. And that family, they sure like fun graphics packages on the car. Don't they? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> Sharp looking liveries for sure. And right now he's doing the job. He has opened that margin up to about 2.6 seconds over the points leader, Weatherill. And just having a fine drive right now. And Musial is motivated. He comes in here. He's tied for second in the points. And that's a good thing. Perhaps the not so good thing is he's 39 points back of Weatherill. And so he needs to make up a little bit of ground here. And the best way to do it is to win and get max points, including that point for pole. Let's get down to Katie, find out what's going on in pit lane. Well, as Musial just passed uh, Weatherill, uh, talking to Justin earlier in the 199, he had said that he's really focusing on looking at the marker and trusting that he's sending it in the right place. I'm sure, Paolo, you could talk a little bit about that. But coming off of Coda, he said he really likes that here at Laguna Seca, it's more like a dance. It's more rhythm, where Coda was more of that stop and go. 
He's obviously looking to get another win as it would be his sixth win of the season. And as I talked to him about those wins, he said it's been actually quite a pleasant surprise to be pulling the wins this season. Well, he has been awfully strong in that. It is, uh, we get a great look of him here on replay in slow-mo working through the legendary corkscrew. Uh, he has just proven to be a really strong driver in a fairly short period of time. Uh, he's developed some of these skills. Again, I think great tribute to the coaching that goes on here. But let's talk about what Katie mentioned. That uh, you know, Circuit of the Americas, there's a lot of really tight, and you know, that stadium section in 1 and 11 and all that. This track does have more of a flow to it, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I prefer a technical track like, like this one to drive. Cota is beautiful, for sure. It's a Formula One style track. With more, it's more wider than this one. Right. So I prefer this type of track as driver. And one corner I want to get your opinion on here, and we'll get to it in just a moment, is Watt shows the nose to Aiken. That's a look at fourth. And uh, Aiken not having any of it at this stage and shuts the door. But what this is allowed, this little bit of a battle, I think Aiken right now, uh, he's not the quicker of the cars out here. Watt is all over the back of him. And uh, Whittle and Barrowalt and Clark are starting to close in as well. This could very quickly become a five-car battle for that four spot. Make it six now as uh, John Viscup, who is in his rookie season, is giving it a go as well. Wow, nice move there by Beiervolt. Almost got down underneath Whittle in turn number 11. Not quite getting it done. Beiervolt in that brilliant yellow machine right behind him is Lisa Clark in those colors so associated over the years with the John Wire golf programs that ran at Le Mans for so many years. And then the red Ferrari of Viscup behind her. There is Beiervolt sitting in that seventh spot right now, but watching the attack that uh, Michael Watt right here is putting on that black entry of Chris Aiken. Yeah, six, six cars very close to turn two. A nice uh, battle. All right, here we go up through turn five. Very important corner here because it starts to climb. But I was going to ask you, we talk about the rhythm of this track, and then turn six is just this weird angle. It's just very unlike the rest yeah. of the track. Yeah, it's one of the best of the, of the track. This corner is where it's, where it's a corner where you have to, to be, to, to trust in the grip of the car yeah. because it's faster and it's blind. It's truly what you would call a full commitment corner. Yeah, yeah. You, I, as you said, you turn in blind, and if you overshoot, you're off. And if you if you're if you're too slow through it, then you're just slow all the way up the hill, right? Yeah. Very important for the next three. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's one of the more intriguing corners that we race on. That no question about that. Boy, look at Vault now. The yellow Ferrari looking at Charles Whittle, seeing if he can make any kind of a move here. Not able to get anything done at this point. Beiervolt has one top five so far this season, coming at the most recent event in Coda. Whittle has a fourth in Indianapolis. And Watt, he's trying different lines now, trying to figure a way around and to get by. Ooh, and a wiggle there by uh, yeah, Aiken as he exits. Yeah, he's trying to find the room to overtake, but as we know, it's not easy in the year. So he tried. You have to, and sometimes you have to get creative, don't you? Yeah, and see if the gun in front to make a small mistake and you can try to, to put your nose, your nose in front of the car. Now Aiken protected going in to turn five. That's going to mean he's probably not that fast out. But Watt was so tucked in behind him, there's really not a lot yeah. you can do. It's what for sure is faster than Aiken. He's trying to do his best to overtake him. Got to be brave to make yeah. a pass into the corkscrew, and Watt decides to go for it. Down to the inside. Aiken senses him, opens the wheel up a little bit, and I think Aiken realized that if I turn in, that's contact, and uh, better to just let him through. Yeah. Watt was much faster in the exit of the corner, the first corner, so he got uh, the, the, the speed there, and he did a very late braking. That was a great, great move by Mike Watt that's going to move him now up into fourth. And it'll drop Christopher Aiken in the 119 back into the fifth spot. And right away for Aiken, his mirrors fill once again with the white Ferrari of Charles Whittle. As you can see now, the, the pace of Watt is, is fast. So much faster than uh, Aiken. Well, Watt had set the fastest time in the combined practice of all the three practice sessions. He was the pace setter. 
and then didn't get the qualifying run that he wanted. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't where he, I'm sure, felt he could be. So he's now going to mount a charge. Problem is, they've lost a lot of time to the group up front. And this, this is a 30-minute race, and he's got to right now find, what, about 20 seconds? Yes, 20 seconds. Now it's, I think it's difficult to, to catch the car in front, uh, but uh, he, he can do a good race and uh, try to do his best to finish for maybe, maybe third, but it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the thing is that what I love about these weekends is the double header. So you have a good race today, not maybe where you wanted to be, but you make a pass like that, yeah. and you're motivated, you learn, you, now you can apply things tomorrow. Yeah, again, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, you can try to do the best lap time, uh, try to make a pace of the race to see for tomorrow. I was it the car. Looking here at the 127 of Lisa Clark leading the Ladies' Cup and uh, having a really good run, as I said, eighth overall. Started in ninth, has moved up a spot, and is challenging for yet more. And as I said, Lisa here, uh, she has sort of a love affair with this place because uh, she has had some great runs last year in the combined Copa Shell, Copa Shell Am race. She was running in Copa Shell Am, had two thirds, but both of them were top five overall. And she is really, really quick. And for Lisa, she missed the opening couple of rounds here. So she's behind the eight ball. Of Katie, oh, big moment for her, Katie. Hold on, John Biscup, who was Closing on Lisa Clark, trying to get a little bit better run coming out of the Andretti turn, looped it, and has now lost another spot, but he's gathered it up. Let's get now let's get down to you, Katie. <laughs> Big moments here at Laguna Seca, but for Lisa Clark, she's trying to keep herself focused. One place that she's really focusing on is turn six. She said that compression as she's getting back in the car here this season has been playing with her a little bit mentally. She's also California native. She has some family here, her two daughters. But taking it back long ago, she actually got involved in racing uh, through her desert dad. She was really into off road racing, but she thought that really has helped her uh, learn balance, traction, and working specifically in the car. Uh, it doesn't matter the payoff. She's obviously running uh, very well here this season, especially getting back in. Yeah, no question about it. And, uh, you know, they debuted the Evo car, Road Atlanta, and she didn't run that round. So she's just a, a race or two behind some of these other cars in terms of, uh, or other drivers in terms of getting experience with this car. Oh, and a big move there by Beiervault as he jumps up the inside of Wittal. They're still side by side. Whittle not going quietly. He got forced way out wide. Lisa Clark sneaks through as well. So Beiervault, an aggressive move on Whittle. And it got him way out wide, and Lisa Clark jumped on that. And uh, that move by Beyerwald, very aggressive. Did he give enough room on the exit of the turn? Yeah, it was uh, aggressive, but it was, uh, I think, it was, I did a good job. I did a good job because they were side by side. Uh, they were trying to do his line. And then, uh, right. Yeah, that track went uh, wide in the dirty part of the track. And a very opportunistic move by Lisa Clark to read yeah. that. She read that very well. And, squared up underneath and uh, getting back to what Katie said talking about Lisa you know she uh, did dirt bikes and she's doing very well she is she's attacking <laughs> on Beyerwald yeah got a great run there and now heading up this is that turn that Lisa was talking about that we are right as you get to the apex right there is the compression that uh, that she said was just getting into her head a little bit yeah look it's, it's very she's very fast she, she is very I think she she can try to overtake uh, the car in front. I think so too. She, uh, like I said, she's had some uh, just wonderful runs in this category. After she had that great run here last year, uh, had a bit of an uh, incident at Montreal and ended up having to move into a different car. And I know in theory the cars are all identical you know, the previous car, but each car has its little differences and just took her a while and then she missed the opening couple of rounds this year. So She's getting back to uh, showing the uh, speed that we know she is capable of doing a nice job. Back in the pack just a little bit. Jan Bernier right there in that silver and orange car and a big move late by Cyril Choksi. And boy, did he dive down the inside. I was sure he was going to overrun the exit of 11 and he made it work. Yeah, he did a very late break. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was indeed. Of course, I'm sure he's He's a little fired up in that helmet after uh, he was the one who had that spin earlier when he got yeah. tapped. So I'm sure he is back yeah, in the he wants to try, yeah, to go back on his position. And the 
the car right in front of him is the uh, car of, uh, trying to get the number on that as it flashed through. I think that's Anthony DiCarlo, the 100. And I think he's down a lap yeah. right now. So if he can get through on Anthony, then he can maybe, uh, the next driver in line that he would go after would be Roy Carroll up the road a bit. And, uh, not sure what the problem is with Anthony. And there's the, that was the 128 of Robert Hertzberg. And he too is down a lap, so they're dealing with something. This is interesting here because DiCarlo in that red car is down a lap right now. And Choxie is showing some real speed. And that next car up line is a, I think, who he wants to get after here. Have to see what he can do to get around Anthony DiCarlo. Oh, he wanted it there. That's a tough place. I think it was a couple of years ago that, uh, I think it was last year actually, that Cooper McNeil and Benjamin Ites got together up in turn 10. Happen to the best of them for sure. I'll tell you, Anthony DiCarlo there in that red car, he's down a lap, but he's showing some good speed. It's a nice slow mo of the two of them working the corkscrew. Yeah, very nice. You can see the movement of the car. Yeah. And if you stay in, in that corkscrew at the bottom, way to the right, there's a huge compression bump. It's better to float out a little bit, isn't it? Yeah. Find the fork line. If you are too much on the, right, the second part of the cruise crew, if you are too much on the right, there's a bump there. So it's better to, to be close to the curve, but not too much. Quick drivers always seem to figure that out right away. Good scrap here, the 131 of uh, Luis Peruskia, the lead car, the all red car, being chased right now by John Lennon in the 107 entry. John running for Ferrari of San Francisco, and John had set a time in qualifying that I believe was in the top five in the class. But as I said, post tech, they found the car a little bit too low in the rear, so he's coming up through the field. Beautiful move there, down to the inside in 11, and he picks up now, that's ninth. In the 173, yeah, that's a real choxie. And you got to think he was, he got a little uh, aggressive on uh, trying to get around the lap car to Carlo. And it maybe uh, yeah. got around on him here. We didn't see yeah. it, but yeah. I heard it, I thought. Yeah. So what a drive by John Lennon up from, this is a 20 car field and he was right at the back. And has now worked his way up into ninth. Great story, coached by Johnny O'Connell. Johnny's got a few laps around this place. Won a World Challenge GT Championship here, I believe. And Lennon has proven to be a quick study. First season for him in competition. But absolutely loves it. You can hear that compression there, that splitter touches, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, we do. We go full course for Choxie. I was wondering about that because it didn't look like he was going to be able to go anywhere, but one hopes. And this is going to be interesting because yeah, we were good. talking about how fast some of these cars were. Well, that margin goes away. Yeah. You know, what can be close to the third place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fighting. And unfortunately for Dave Musial, over three second lead he just systematically built up over Weatherill is going to evaporate as well and we have 10 minutes to go in this one so hopefully they can get that car extracted pretty quickly yes. but if they do it's not going to be a lot yeah. of racing left is it yeah i think so the car is close to the asphalt so yeah it should be quite quick good and for john lennon let's see the margin he had he had another five seconds to get to that Great battle with Whittle in eighth and Clark in seventh and Beyervalt in sixth and Aiken in uh, fifth. And he's showing some speed. I mean, Lennon's last lap was a 131.2 and everybody around him is running 133s or high 132s. So that number 107, Ferrari of San Francisco entry, has some serious speed right now. Yeah. 
Best lap of the race, though, right now is Musial Jr. at a 129.834. And that is important as we go by Surreal's car. So it should be, you're right, if they can get it pulled out quickly. You get a point for fast lap in this series. And as I said, he's trying to dig into that points lead of Wetherill. And 15 points for a win, 12 for second. So uh, you add the pole point and the fast lap point, that's five points he can take away from Wetherill. He's going to have to do that a lot in these last few races to make up the points deficit he has. So now, from a driver's perspective at this stage, you're in your, your race game, you've been in battles, adrenaline's going, you're into it. Suddenly it all stops with a full course caution. You're just driving around behind the pace car. What do you have to deal with mentally to then get back up on the wheel when it goes to green? Yeah, if I'm second, I'm happy because I can <laughs> catch the first. If I was first, I was not happy because you, you lose uh, your your sec your uh, advantage advantage, uh, advantage compared to the car behind you. So for sure, for sure, Musa need to, to keep a concentration, to be focused on the driving, and uh, I think there will be a green flag. I think in the last for the last two three minutes. Uh, a shootout. Yeah, yeah, shoot that. That. <laughs> two, two very hot laps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now on a track like this, where we talked about the grip, but also, you know, a lot of, of the issues is the sand that comes up on the track when a driver drops a tire and the sand comes up, or it just blows up onto the track surface. Under caution here, when you know the next lap you're going green, is it even more important than on, on other tracks to make sure your tires are cleaned or scrubbed up? Yeah, for sure, because the, the, the level of the grip is a is lower than other track, uh, so if you if you don't feel very comfortable with the with the, with the grip of the tire, you have to be to be careful, especially in the first few corners. All right, and this is for Michael Watt. We talked about it. There's the opportunity. And 119 right in front of him. That sort of copper, beautiful copper-colored entry. Todd Coleman, Ferrari of Denver. At the 169, I mean, I'm sorry about that. Ferrari of Denver entry. Yes. So that car actually is the 118, that copper colored entry. It's one lap George down, Zachary, yeah. and he's down a lap, so. Well, this will be interesting because Watt's going to have to figure out how to get by him quickly, and then, that's what threw me off, go after the 169 of Coleman. All right. Safety vehicles. So we've got this beautiful drone shot here. Turn 10, that's a tricky corner, isn't it? With that little bit of banking, and you come out of falling away down out of rainy, and if you don't get all the way over, you can't really maximize yeah, it. It's easy to, to lose the control if you are a little bit out of the line uh, with the sand, is a uh, fast, very fast corner, so you can lose the control uh, easily there. Is it very important to stay on the line? Yeah, I would think it's got to be. Classy move right there, class move by the 118. Uh, Zachary just ducked into the pits and got out of the queue here of all the cars racing for position. That, that, that's sportsmanship, and that's, that's one of the great things about Ferrari Challenge is the, uh, you know, we watch some of the videos that we see, and one of the ones they talk about is the friendships and the camaraderie in the paddock, and that's for real. I mean, these yes, drivers, it's, it's they're good friends. Yeah. They and love to snap their visor down and go beat their friend out on the track, but afterwards, you know, they want to do it fairly, and, uh, and uh, they are good friends. Yes, some of the drivers also start together in the Corso Pilota Ferrari, and then now we are racing also together, so uh, it's a nice friendship. And speaking of Corso Pilota, that's the, the Ferrari Challenge, the, the, the uh, approved driving school that is run by Ferrari. You coach in it here, and you also do it in Europe, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do mostly in Europe because I live in Italy. Sure. But I also follow in the Corso Pilota here in the U.S. Huge benefit for, for anybody that wants to get behind the wheel and drive some Ferraris to go through that. Yeah, And same. spend time in yeah, yeah, it's, it's very important to, to learn the technique and also to learn how to drive your Ferrari. So it's very important. 
do that, then do club challenge. Yes. For a year, get coached. Yes. And then get ready then to get go ready race. race. And every coach in uh, Ferrari Challenge is approved. Is certainly North America is is approved by Didier Tays, yeah. who's yeah, the yeah. head coach. Yeah. So you know you're a qualified coach if you're yeah. coaching in Ferrari Challenge, and certainly in Corsa Piloti. All right, here we go. Back to green. Three minutes and 20 seconds. It'll be about three minutes even when the green flag flies. And it does. We're back to racing. And immediately, Weatherill is going to take a look, see what he can do on Musial. And Musial just has to do what he did before. He was so smooth. Oh, look at that. Weatherill was hoping Musial would overshoot the Andretti hairpin. And Musial drove it absolutely beautifully. He's just got to do what he did before when he eased away. Watch that battle for third, Coleman and Watt. See if Watt has anything left for Todd Coleman in that last step of the podium. And right away, that lead group of four make a little bit of a break. Then Chris Aiken, the 119 Ferrari Houston entry, right there appears, then Byervault, then Lisa Clark. Watt looks quick. Yeah. This, I this think is, he's trying. <laughs> you think he's going to do the pass here again? I don't know. Maybe next, <laughs> maybe next lap. <laughs> well, you have to think the coach and spotter for Todd yeah. Coleman told him, "Hey, don't you know? Don't go all the way to the right up into the corkscrew because that's where Watt made a big he's pass trying. earlier." <laughs> yeah, your spies help you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boy, Weatherill had a little bit of a rough run down there through the corkscrew just because he's pushing so hard. All right, we should have two laps, two laps. to go. Yeah. I think John Lennon just passed Whittle for eighth. Back in that queue just a little bit. Lennon's Ferrari, yes, Ferrari of San Francisco. John Lennon, that remarkable charge through the back. There he is. Ooh, locks it up under braking. Kept it under control. Lisa Clark took a look at Byervault, middle of the Andretti turn. Boy, she is ready to get after it today. Yeah, she's doing very well. She has the pace to be maybe in front of the, the the yellow car, but as you know, it's not easy to, to overtake here. So. No. And I think Lisa, her and her spotters are telling nice her. Nice fight yeah. for the second place. Her spotters are telling her. Um, as well that uh, John Lennon is coming really quickly, so you've got to get Firewall. You've got to get him and get him now. And Watt this time not quite as close up the hill. So we go back, watch this battle here. Here's Aiken, Firewall, Lisa Clark, in the orange and blue, and then Lennon right behind. Firewall showing the nose to Aiken in uh, the rainy curve. Tough place to make a pass. Here comes Lennon. Boy, I think he was thinking about going straight to the apex in 10. Now Byerwald gets a good run out of turn 10, gets down the inside. That's going to freeze Aiken. And Lennon tried to go down the inside of both Lisa Clark and Lennon, or excuse me, and Aiken. I think there might even have been a little touch there. Yeah. Now Lisa, she's going to go straight to the apex here. Oh, and I, they may have touched. Yeah, she did. Maybe not. Well, I'll tell you. Nice move. If, yeah, if they didn't touch, it was brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant <laughs> take. It was a great move. Well, that moves her up. Now she can follow Lennon. And if she can stay with Lennon the way he's running right now, If he makes an attack, as we are now officially on the final lap, if Lennon makes an attack up front on Byerwalt, Lisa might be able to follow him through, although she's a little too far back right now, I think. And she got that turn 11 moment, cost her a lot of momentum, and Lennon just went blazing away. And Lennon's closing on Byerwalt. He might have a top five in this one yet. It's going to have to get awfully aggressive. Really folding some speed down through. Looks to the inside, getting in Byerwalt's mirrors. Last corner, maybe. Meanwhile, here comes Musial. 
What a story from Musial from his first pole. He's going to get his first win at Ferrari Challenge competition. Dave Musial 2.0 comes through with a beautiful win and makes up five points on Weatherill, the points leader at this stage. He's second, Coleman is third, Watts fourth, and Byerwald just fended off John Lennon in the yellow Ferrari, the Ferrari of Beverly Hills entry to hang on to top five. But I think the drive of the race was John Lennon coming from, I think, 19th in the field to six. Yeah, he did a very good, uh, good race. Uh, a lot of over overtaking, but uh, also Musial did uh, very well. Yes. The pace was uh, very fast. Well, and he did exactly what he needed to do on that restart, which is yeah. exactly what he had done before the caution, just drive at the speed he knew he could, and Weatherill just didn't quite have the answer on this day. So, wow, what a great run for Musial. For Weatherill, he adds his seventh podium of the season. And Todd Coleman racks up his third podium of the season. So great job by him. And Michael Watt continuing to show some really good speed here in that number 150 Ferrari of Atlanta entry. That's his fourth podium of the year. And for Beyerwalt, that's his uh, second top five. Got one at Circuit of the Americas and now repeats here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. You know, you watch a race like this, it makes you really look forward to tomorrow, doesn't it? Yeah, when, uh, for they're sure. They're going to put on a great show. Yeah, again. for sure. There will be another great show tomorrow. It's very important to start uh, to the qualify in the car in front because, as we, we can see, it's not easy to overtake here. Here are the uh, provisional results. Musial, Weatherill, and Coleman. There are your podium. Then Michael Watt and Kirk Beyervault round out the top five. John Lennon again from, I believe, 19th all the way up into the sixth spot. John Viscup was in that battle near the front, then had that quick spin. And then the rest of the field here, a couple of drivers, uh, just for some reason, we're not exactly sure, folks, to be honest with you, down the lap here. And then Surreal Choksi having that off early when he was tapped after a great qualifying run, and then having another one as well. And then Eileen Bildman once again, not able to make the start. Sad to see that. Um, but uh, boy, what a great race here for the Copal Shell Am competitors. And they, of course, will be making their way down into the victory circle area. Big thanks to Paolo for sitting in with us here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I hope to see you soon. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Uh, great competitor. Announced him a few times at Lama when we were covering it there for speed. And uh, he's... He's running that right now. He ran it this year, of course, but he's a two-time second-place finisher at Le Mans and a finished second in the FIGT championship as well. Let's take a look at some highlights. And from his first pole, Dave Musial Jr. jumped into an early lead, then a little bit of a touch here, and Surreal Choksi went around after that little bit of a tap there by Coleman. He was able to get going again. The gravel there, not too bad. Some great slow-mo shots. This of Justin Weatherill working his way through the legendary corkscrew here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. And some fierce battling unfolding. Big move there by Kirk Beyervault underneath Charles Whittle. And in that blue and orange Ferrari, Lisa Clark taking advantage. Some other great slow-mos here. The lap car of Anthony DiCarlo and uh, recovering Surreal Choksi. And then the restart after a caution and doing exactly what he had done before the caution, Dave Musial just drove some pristine, beautiful laps and worked his way through. Beautiful pass right there by Lisa Clark on Chris Aiken, moved her up into the seventh spot and a great drive by Lisa at a track that she has a great history with. But in the end, Dave Musial Jr. ends up bringing home his first win from his first pole and getting fast lap of the race as well. And there is a look at the big hill, and up on the top is where that legendary corkscrew is. 
Thanks for joining us here for our coverage of the first of the doubleheader races for Copa Shell Am here at round five of the Fry Challenge Championship at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. Big thanks to Paulo Roberti for joining us and to Katie. Look forward to having you with us for round two of their race weekend tomorrow. But coming up soon, don't go too far. It's Trofeo Pirelli, Trofeo Pirelli Am and Copa Shell's race in just a few.